For several years, I've been an avid reader of No Sleep, but because of my profession, I was never permitted to submit content to it, or to anywhere. Occasionally, an Area 51 story pops up. I used to work at Area 51, or I snuck into Area 51, etc. These stories always made me want so badly to finally jump in here, but I always held my tongue until now. Using a series of proxies and all kinds of networking jibber-jabber, I think I'm in the clear making this post. I won't bore you with the details. I came here to no sleep after years of lurking to correct a lot of the misapprehensions and legends about the most infamous military installation in the world. I'm doing this now because even if I get caught, I have a really useful insurance policy. I'm seriously ill and not likely to recover, and I've got no family that I'm in contact with that could be retaliated against. There's nothing anybody can do, I think. There is no such thing as Area 51. Sorry. And the fact that it's the golden egg of conspiracy theories worldwide is exactly what the US government wants. I'm writing this in a bit of a rush and I don't have any of my thoughts organized, so I'm just going to break it down as follows. Groom Lake, Paradise Ranch, Edwards AF Extension, Restricted Training Facility UX-104. These are a few names for the place you know as Area 51. I don't know much about its history, but essentially, it was intended by the US Air Force to be a secret weapons testing facility during the Cold War. It had a few on-site extensions. One of them was for developing experimental rocket and jet engines, one was for contingents of troops for nuclear warfare and post-apocalyptic survival, etc. But much like the third Star Wars movie, the site and its purpose got out around the time of the Roswell incident, and a media frenzy popularized the base. The government tried at first to quell speculation about it, but then adopted another strategy. Feed into the hype, and simply move the base a few dozen miles away. Today, Groom Lake, aka Area 51, is a small but functional military airport and base. It's got a bunch of bunkers mostly housing low security servers, and some munitions tests are performed there. Staff are regularly moved in and out, mostly folks who are low on the totem pole and trying to climb up the ladder to the real facility. There are some very outdated nuclear fallout shelters that are still maintained and used for storage. The facility consumes an enormous amount of power, and everything possible is done to make it look like a well-guarded military base that is engaged in some huge secret operations. The employees really do fly there every day from Las Vegas on conspicuously inconspicuous jets marked as Janet, sometimes referred to as just another non-existent terminal. And they want you to notice, and wonder. They want you to wonder where those jets are going. And they never want you to spend one second thinking about where they came from. The real Area 51. This is the most exciting part, because as far as I can tell in my limited and clandestine researching, Nobody has ever divulged the real secret before. It's pretty highly guarded, and they straight up murder people who are stupid enough to share it. Murder isn't even the right word. They erase people from existence, sometimes entire families. That's why the government freaks out when they find that one of their employees is terminal and has nothing left to lose. It's why if you're an employee there, you only see their doctors, so that they know about your health before you even know about it. They want you to die real quick of a sudden heart attack, so that you never have a moment to think about how you might do a public service and air their dirty laundry. And sometimes they induce those heart attacks when they determine you to be an HMT, or health motivated threat. But I didn't need to see a doctor to know that I am suffering from the same malignant tumor that killed my father, glioblastoma multiforma. Every three months we get a health evaluation, and every six months we get a CAT scan. I simply didn't report the very damning symptoms this past eval, and I'll probably be gone before they scan me next. I really wanted to do this instead. Maybe just to be the first, I guess. The only other thing I've ever done with my life is fix computers. The real secret military base is McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas. 
The history of the airport was always bound up in military involvement. Before and during World War II, the Army Corps of Engineers and the Air Force were building, storing, training, and doing all sorts of things there. Basically, the government and its corporate benefactors in the military-industrial complex, of course, acquired full ownership of the airport around the time Area 51 slash Groom Lake exploded in the public eye. It was a rush job, and a simple solution. For all intents and purposes, McCarran is an airport. It moves civilians in and out and all over the world just like any other airport on Earth, but its subterranean operations are really something else entirely. First of all, you have to understand the structure of this military base. Because it serves ostensibly as a business of public transportation, every single aspect of the base has dual functions. This is called masking, and it is deployed with remarkable effectiveness at McCarran. To name a few examples, the constant takeoffs and landings of airplanes provides sound camouflage for cutting-edge engine tests. The public completely ignores these sounds and dismisses them as the standard cacophony of airports. Some of the jets themselves are even equipped with technology under test, while others are used to transport hundreds of government employees dressed as vacationing civilians. At any given time in McCarran, up to six of the gates are filled with employees of the highest echelons of the US military and government. They sit around on their iPhones dressed as college kids in their pajamas or weary businessmen, and they're paid to look the part. The entire base is heavily guarded by plainclothes soldiers. Military police, tactical specialists, counterterrorism forces, and all kinds of soldiers scurry about the airport dressed like cops, airport security, and desk attendants. The weapons are usually concealed sidearms. The real firepower is packed by the boys waiting around underground. Assault rifles and armor-piercing weaponry is stored around the airport's public spaces in various places. It's not hard to do because nobody's looking for it. And of course, they hire a good number of civilians to work the TSA in other positions. This is called mixing, and it's necessary. What kind of airport would never post any job listings? Have you ever watched the mechanics ducking in and out of the planes outside, or seen your luggage loaded onto the plane as you board? Well, all of that cargo transport activity acts as a cover for the mass movement of special forces, lab equipment, military hardware, exotic building materials, etc. It's not hard to do. They drive one of those rigs by with all the luggage spilling out of it, and then you instinctively don't question what's on the other four rigs behind it. We even have mix-up and spills occasionally, and nobody bats an eye. You're always exposed to some level of radiation while flying, and McCarran, by the way, is why the standard of safe exposure is set where it's at. But excess radiation from weapons testing is vented into the earth and out of the nearby desert. Having an airport to explain the radiation is an effective means of ridding the base of nosy folks with Geiger counters. But the true genius of this top secret military installation is at the largest scale. The base was built under an airport because of the enormity of its power consumption. But it consumes a lot more power than a regular airport. So it was built in a city that consumes a tremendous amount of power. Las Vegas. So the base is hidden from view, even on the electric power grid. Area 51? Not so much. And that's on purpose. So if Area 51 is the little distraction, what do we call the real one? It has many names, but it's usually referred to as the Nexus. That's an acronym, but not many people know what it means. Not even me. Everything about the Nexus from its operations to its structure is compartmentalized. That means everything is need to know and virtually nobody knows anything more than their own specific task. You could work in an office in the Nexus doing something like accounting and never have one single clue what the woman next to you does. Or the guy down the hall. They say not even the president knows exactly what's going on there. Just a few generals and some dudes in the CIA. The business culture here is insane. Everyone is smiling, everyone is fine, and everyone is happy to say just a few phrases about what it is they do. When we're allowed to socialize, which is not much. Every line is bugged, every room has a camera in it, and nobody knows who's watching and listening, or when. So that makes you think. Nobody here is telling me the truth about anything. Not even the guy I share an office with. 
I wonder if any of us know why we are here. People you've worked with for a long time will suddenly get reassigned or have a medical emergency and you'll never see them again. And nobody will remember that person no matter how many people you ask. I actually got hired to do some programming for the Navy when I was in my early 20s out of college and then got sent to Groom Lake to do server tests. They liked my IT and networking skills so after a series of strange psychological tests and mountains of non-disclosure agreements and background searches, I got offered a job at a facility near Las Vegas proper. Here are a few stipulations of that job, by the way. It's a $1.5 million after-tax lump sum, plus a $220,000 a year stipend, housing, car, medical paid for, but psychological breakdowns, anxiety attacks, grave health conditions, and family issues void the contract. I also signed approximately two new non-disclosure agreements per week most of which read under penalty of death somewhere. Employees aren't allowed to leave the grounds for five years, and we all live underground. Term of service is five years, then four in debriefing, wherein we get to live in Vegas but report to another facility four days a week. We are discharged and observed for the rest of our lives. Our passports are permanently void. We cannot ever leave the continental U.S., I heard a statistic that 20% of former employees commit suicide. I don't know if it's true, but if it is, I bet it's actually, uh, suicide. The base is underground. It's a large network of structures called hives, which form what is called the colony, or the nexus. We make lots of Resident Evil jokes, by the way. Except unlike in the movie, the government doesn't try to make its employees feel comfortable with fake forests and windows overlooking digital cityscapes. It is a dark, dreary, Soviet-style labyrinth of halls and bunkers replete with all sorts of submarine-like features. Water and airtight hatches, trap doors, reinforced blast doors, etc. The only exception are the office buildings inside where chair moisteners like me work. They look just like the office you work in. Except the men with guns standing guard 24-7 everywhere, looking over your shoulder. Oh, and the beautiful, almost surreal glow of the cutting-edge laboratories that pock the lower levels of each building. I've never been in them, but I've passed by them a few times. There are four hives to my knowledge, although I wouldn't be surprised if there were more. I work in Hive 1. I run some of the servers with a few other guys on one particular floor. There are 16 floors in our hive. But we monitor and maintain all of the servers in Hive 1 so we move around a bit. I've gotten to skim some of the data that passes through and from what I can tell, we're the most boring hive. I've compiled the following list based on the things I've intercepted on our networks and also from hearsay from other coworkers. The Nexus has multiple networks and they're all decentralized. But there are some ways in which they communicate, and it is via those lines of communication that I am privy to some sensitive information. Here's what I know. I have one. Finance, accounting, operations, organization divisions, troop training, housing, and some small-scale weapons testing. I have two. Chemical engineering, some nanotech research, and advanced psychological fitness, whatever that means, for elite military forces. Probably black ops stuff and how to survive 30 years in solitary confinement at a Siberian prison. I also have reason to believe this is the hive where the bigwigs meet and live. Hive 3, upper levels. Bioweapon and disease research and testing. If the government has zombies, they've got to be here. I've wanted to make so fucking many zombie jokes over the years, but I never know which of my co-workers is a rat. Lower levels. Advanced space travel and space warfare technologies. Particle engines and gravitational beams and the like. I'm guessing there's no real evidence. Science fiction stuff. I once saw an email with all sorts of coded language marked AB, which is widely believed to refer to astrobiology. That's alien life. Maybe it's just some single-celled organisms or fossilized plants from some meteor. Or maybe it's something much more advanced. 
Whatever it is, there must be some reason it's not on the upper levels with all the biologists. Hive 4 Total Information Blackout There are encryptions and firewalls and network security features protecting this hive that I've never seen before. Not even on top secret navy projects I worked in the past. I'm being very non-specific in the language I use to describe our server clusters and networks because I don't want to tell them exactly who I am. They'll eventually find out anyway. But there's a widely whispered rumor about Hive 4. Allegedly, the most terrifying thing in the world is in that structure on floor 15. There are a few unusual things about Hive 4. First of all, none of the top brass has clearance to get in there. They access it remotely via video feed in their conference rooms and materials are often transported from 4 to 2 for physical review. I don't know why our bigwigs won't go into 4, but maybe it's because it's too dangerous. There was one guy who worked in 4 a few years ago when I first started, and he caused the first Nexus-wide lockdown I've ever seen. He was being escorted through one thumpers, what we call the squads of black-booted soldiers that grant access to different hives, and he started shrieking about IDAs, I didn't hear the screams, but I heard the gunshot while I was eating lunch. They put a bullet in the back of his head before he could finish his sentence. IDAs, by the way, are interdimensional anomalies. I have no further information on what those are. Another thing I've read minimally about are the twins. I don't know who or what these are, but they're the above top secret gem of Hive 4. It is treasonous to even correspond about them on our secure networks unless you are cleared to do so, and only four employees are. I've only seen a few things about them. One was a medical record. No vitals, unusual vocalizations that manifest hallucinations and psychosis in nearby employees, and skin that produces violent nausea when touched. The document was basically speculation that the skin functions much like the Australian stinging tree, or a jellyfish. I read documents about people who worked with them as well. In 4, a woman was remanded to the psychological ward after being in the same room with them, and a soldier who stood outside of the laboratory where they are kept basically killed himself. Specifically, he peeked inside during a routine access, then began bashing his own brains out with the butt of a pistol while singing an Irish folk song. The woman who was remanded to psych was even weirder. During breakfast with her colleagues, she grabbed a fork, stood up, walked out of the mess hall, stripped all of her clothes off, blinded herself in both eyes, then somehow managed to make her way all the way up to floor 1, where the access corridor to Hive 3 is located. How she managed to operate the dozens of keycard readers, passcode boxes, and retinal scanners is still under review. Last email regarding her was sent in 2012 about how she sits in the dark of solitary on floor 11's psych ward with a permanent and blissful grin on her face. One of my colleagues whom I trust told me that he saw the twins once through hacked access to a video feed. He said they are woman-like, about twice as tall as a full-grown man with unidentifiable black growths dangling from their heads, like hair, but thicker and they basically float a few inches off the ground and drag their toes lightly as they move. They're utterly pale. He never saw the faces, but he claims that they appear to distort reality, or at least the video feed, in such a way that space looks bent around them. Perhaps these are the IDAs that earlier dude was screaming about. That's all I have for now, but hopefully the world knows the truth someday about what goes on down here. We are all basically prisoners. We have very limited and supervised access to the internet. So if you don't hear from me again, assume they figured me out. My name is Felix.